they have built an economy that outsources that pollution to places here in Asia where I live and to places where you live because they don't want their rivers polluted. They don't want to see what happens in Indonesia or in the DRC. And so when you hear in Congress this saying, well, we want to mine these resources at home and process these resources at home, I don't think that they are fully thinking through what the consequences of that are. And I do argue in the book that unless we're willing to have those tough conversations now, as this 21st century economy ramps up, you know, we could see many of the same mistakes happen in this century because whoever controls the production of copper and nickel and cobalt and lithium and other critical minerals will control the 21st century economy. You want to put that on the table? It's just not enough for us to compete on the market. We're going to have to search for money where we're going to find money. And that's money. Most of the time, it's always on Chinese hand. And yes, so at the end, it's like to all of them, not only about the U.S., to all of them, I will say, why are you guys engaging in a fight that you do know that you are not structurally set to win or to compete for? The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City, and joining me today from the beautiful island of Mauritius is CGSP's Africa editor, Jeronima. A very good afternoon to you, Jero, and welcome back after an exciting month of paternity leave. Yes, really, and it still is somehow a very exciting month and uh, having to get around <laughs> with that new reality that I'm grappling with. And uh, yes, yes uh, it's a very good moment. So yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be back and uh, happy for our listeners to remain faithful to our show and I'm um, looking forward to have this conversation again. So Giraud is now a proud member of the Daddy Club, so uh, very <laughs> exciting to have him on board and into the special club. So it's been a very exciting and monumental past couple of weeks. If you're a U.S. policymaker in Washington, D.C., following the critical mineral space, we've been talking a lot over the past year about the Lobito Corridor that runs from the Democratic Republic of the Congo via Zambia and then all the way across Angola to the port of Lobito on the Atlantic coast. The U.S. has committed a lot of money and a lot of effort to refurbish this railway, ostensibly as a way to break China's dominance in the critical mineral space. Well, now, after months and months, years and years of talking, things are actually starting to move. Earlier this month, Amos Hochstein, who is the U.S. Special Presidential Coordinator for Global Infrastructure and Energy Security. That's basically Washington talk for him being the top guy on critical minerals at the State Department. He reposted a Bloomberg story on X about the Lobito Atlantic Railway exporting its first shipment of copper to the U.S. from the DRC and said, and I'm quoting here, Jeho, this is a BFD. Now, you may not know what a BFD is, but it's short for Big Effing Deal. And since this is a family show, I can't actually say what the F is, but you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, it's a little unusual for diplomats to use this kind of language, but I guess that's where we are in 2024. Yeah. That copper cargo traveled a thousand kilometers by rail and made a six-day journey from the port of Lobito to the port of Baltimore on the east coast of the U.S., Giraud, why does someone like Hochstein think that this is such a big effing deal? I believe that because since the beginning of the Lobito Corridor project, since, I mean, once they get the U.S. get involved in that project, it was presented as uh, the big thing, the big U.S. initiative to start countering China in Africa, to start countering China in the DRC when it comes to critical minerals being cobalt and copper in the DRC. So for them, having the first shipment of 
copper, and I'm emphasizing on copper because there is a, it's, it's very important to, to highlight that. So for them to have that first shipment of copper leaving the DRC using the Lobito Corridor to go to the US, yes, it's something they want to brag about. It'd be something they want to show that, yes, we are making progress, we are doing something big, and something is really happening, even though it's not really something big, actually. And I don't want to comment much more on that. We may need to go further on that, but it's not really that of a big of a deal. But it's something important. That's why I believe that from an optic perspective, they really want to show that, you know, it's something, things are starting, we are moving somewhere, we are going somewhere, even though, in fact, it's much more nuanced than that. It's not really that a BFD, as he said. Well, it's a BFD if you've not moved anything. And the fact that they're moving something, even though you're saying it's quantity-wise still relatively small, that should be taken in context. It's not even about quantity-wise. It's about, first of all, we are talking about copper. And copper, DRC today refine 99% of copper. It means that DRC produce copper metals. It means that it can go straight from the DRC to any countries that can really made like cable, anything that you want to use with copper because we are producing 100% copper metal because we do that refinery at home already. So having that copper leaving the DRC to go to a company or to a, to a manufacturer in the US is not really big of a deal because you already have copper leaving the DRC go to Switzerland. It's not really big of a deal because those coppers are not going to be processed otherwise. They're going to be go straight to manufacture to make what they want to do. So if it's presented as a way that Lobito Corridor was something, was a first step for us to counter China in terms of like refining, in terms of processing, in terms of accessing cobalt like cobalt from the DRC, which is going to need refining and processing and enrichment you see that it's not really big of a deal. It's just DRC sending copper, a 100% metal copper to the US. And that's one thing. And the second thing, let's face it, so far we've been saying that for so long, I'm going to repeat it again. Lobito Corridor is just a logistic project so far. We've been to DC, we've talked to people. It's much more than what we know in terms of critical minerals. It's also something else. But the way they present it as a very first step for critical minerals, you realize that Unless you have a mining companies on the ground extracting those copper and those cobalt, Lobito Corridor is just a railway that can move anything, any product from the DRC to Angola and in the region. It's not really a big of a deal. And the third point I wanted to highlight here it was the fact that, interestingly enough, I'll try to read in the reports where that copper was coming from. Maybe I missed it because, you know, being in opportunity leave, I didn't really follow up in the details, but I didn't see the company where that copper came from. If that copper came from a company like Ivanhoe, Kamua Projects, I'm sorry, it's still a Chinese copper because Ivanhoe is doing a joint venture with Zijin Mining, a Chinese company. So if it's coming from there, I'm sorry, it's still a Chinese copper. So yeah, we don't know that. We don't know for sure. So yes, we're going to wait for that. And unless it came from Eurasian group, maybe. So yes, but yeah, you have that. That's why for me, it's not really that big of a deal at the end. We'll try and get some more details. In the meantime, let's hear from Hochstein himself about why he thinks the U.S. gaining some measure of control over its supply of critical resources is so important. Now, I'm going to play you a clip here from an Atlantic Council event that he spoke at last year. And even though this sound is a little bit old, the challenges facing the U.S. remain the same. So if you look at materials that are necessary for batteries or materials that are necessary for wind, and you break it down and you look item by item, and suddenly you realize that graphite is mined in many different countries, but it's processed only in one country. And we're going to have two new processing facilities in the United States likely over the next couple of years, but that will supply a very small percentage of what, even just a small percentage of what the United States needs. And then look at lithium and who's, who's owning the assets, who owns the mining, who owns the processing, who owns cobalt, who owns the mining, where is it going? Nickel, copper. Copper we need not just for batteries, we need it across, uh, if you want to electrify everything, copper is really important. So all of that is right now concentrated in one country, in China. China controls somewhere between 60 and 100% of all the items that I just mentioned. So we have to, as we talk about accelerating the investment, it's not just about deployment of cells or of turbines and building the grid, we actually have to accelerate the investment that the rest of the world, this is not just about US versus China, it's about making sure that we have a diversified energy system. And if I'm I'm, I'm not looking to have all the processing in the United States, the IRA is definitely intended to uh, build up our own capacities, but we need that around the world. 
Now, building up overseas supply chains like what's going on in Angola and the Libido Corridor is one part of the strategy. The other part of the strategy is to do what China does and mine more of these resources at home. Two years ago, early on in his administration, U.S. President Joe Biden unveiled a plan to commit millions of dollars to mine critical resources in the United States. So we're announcing a major investment in domestic production of key minerals and materials. Today, China controls most of the global market in these minerals. And the fact that we can't build uh, a future that's made in America if we ourselves are dependent on China for the materials that power the products of today and tomorrow. And this is not anti-China or anti-anything else, it's pro-American. That's why I'm taking action. We're investing $35 million in MP materials currently America's only rare earth mining and processing operation, to help create a fully domestic supply chain for the magnets that power electric vehicle motors, wind turbines, and so much more. We know that when the federal government invests in innovation, it powers up the private sector to do what they do best. And that's what we're seeing happen. Well, that sounds great, and it makes a lot of sense given that the U.S. is geologically endowed with huge quantities of lithium, copper, and other metals that are needed to power the Green Revolution. But still, two years later, after President Biden made those remarks, very little of that stuff is coming out of the ground. And that has some people on Capitol Hill, including West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, very upset. While Congress has given the administration tools to secure our supply chain, In recent legislation, I'm incredibly frustrated that the bipartisan demand for urgency seems to be going unheard. Benchmark mineral intelligence estimates that at least 336 new mines are needed for graphite, lithium, nickel, and cobalt to meet EV demands prior to 2035. However, an insufficient number of new mines are currently in development to meet that demand, while those projects that are under development face long time frames and considerable risk. When we refuse to allow mining and processing here in timely fashion, we encourage it to occur in countries with lower environmental and labor standards than we were permitted at home. No one in the administration or Congress denies this reality. But we haven't seen any major projects approved by the U.S. Forest Service or the Department of Interior at any point during this administration. What we have seen is environmental impact statements for mineral projects rescinded to undergo years of additional review and consultation with no end in sight. Other projects, including one that has received Defense Production Act funding so that the Department of Defense can manufacture desperately needed ammunition, have seen their schedules slip over and over again. Not only has the administration delayed the minerals projects that we need, they appear to be taking the position that we don't have a permitting problem at all for critical minerals. So when we talk about the battle for critical minerals and resources, there are actually two struggles taking place, at least in the United States. One between the U.S. and China for overseas supply chains and the other domestically in the United States among various special interest groups that Senator Manchin was talking about that have made mining for these resources very difficult and some people say impossible. Well, let's get a perspective on this from the author of a new book that came out earlier this year, The War Below, Lithium, Copper, and the Global Battle to Power Our Lives. Uh, Reuters correspondent Ernest Scheider, who joins us on the line this morning from the great state of Texas. Ernest, congratulations on the book, and thank you for taking the time to help enlighten us about this complex issue. Hey, it's great to be with you both. So you heard those sound bites that I played from Amos Hochstein, Joe Biden, and Joe Manchin, all from a, a year or two ago. Your book, in many ways, is like a report card in how the U.S. is doing today in the critical resources competition. I guess let's just start. How are they doing? Well, there's a huge desire right now, of course, to do something about climate change. And of course, even putting aside those efforts, there is the whole electrification of our global economy that's just really gaining pace rapidly. Just think about all the electronic gadgets and gizmos that we use in our lives that we didn't even 10, 20 years ago. You know, the fact that we're talking through microphones right now, et cetera, et cetera. All of those need critical minerals. And as Senator Manchin was saying in the clip that you played, there hasn't really been a wrestling with where, how, and why the United States hopes to procure these critical minerals. There's a huge tension point within the country around, are there some places too special to mine? Where would we allow mining? How would we process these minerals into the forms that are usable? 
and electronics and other pieces of equipment. And then, of course, there's the global tension that you referenced, Eric, where other countries are really pushing hard in order to get their own supplies of these building blocks. And the United States, when we contrast the United States' demand needs with where supply is coming, say, later this decade and into the new decade, into the 2030s, there is not a match there. It's very curious as to where the United States hope to get these building blocks. And one of the things that I am at pains to stress when I talk about the war below and these issues more broadly is this is not just about electric vehicles. I think sometimes the average person might dismiss this conversation as thinking, oh gosh, I don't own an EV, so why should I care about this? But as we've seen when we just look around our everyday lives, so much of the of the products that we use every single day are built with critical minerals. You know, our cell phones, um, our televisions, et cetera, et cetera. Computers, of course. And so where we get the building blocks matters. And Eric, I think it was the pandemic that really helped encourage people to think through this idea of supply chains. Now, it's, it's sort of a boring, wonky topic, I'll grant you that. But it was roughly four, four and a half years ago that folks, especially in the United States, were shocked to discover that the United States didn't make any masks. And of course, we all needed a very large supply of masks to combat the pandemic. Now, if you just sort of extrapolate that supply chain question mark onto the energy transition, it behooves us to think through where, how, and why we get the building blocks. And so as we sit here today, the United States produces very little lithium. It only has one nickel mine. It has no cobalt mines. It has very limited processing for any of those critical minerals. It does produce a chunk of copper, but it imports a lot of the copper that it needs because it only has a handful of smelters. And so when smelters basically help process copper. And then you heard President Biden speak there about rare earths. There is one rare earth mine in the country right now. It is working to be able to process many of those rare earths into a form that can be turned into magnets. So there are some halting efforts across the domestic United States, but there are many other places in the world that are moving much more rapidly forward on not only their extraction, but their processing of these critical minerals. What I don't get, though, is that the intensity of the rhetoric that you've heard over the past three or four years, and maybe even going back farther from people like Senator Manchin, in terms of really feeling offended that China has taken such an advanced lead in the critical resource competition, and yet so little progress to show for actually doing something about it. Now, they will say we've got the Mineral Security Partnership, they're forming relationships with other countries around the world, but at the end of the day, the United States is well endowed with a lot of these resources. Why is it so difficult for the United States to do what it used to do and mine coal and other stuff that comes out of the ground? Why are they having such a difficult time today in lithium, cobalt, and some other of these critical minerals? I think you actually might have just alluded to it subconsciously there, Eric, without even realizing it. You referenced coal. And I think for better or worse, in the United States, when people think about mining, they think about coal mining, mostly because for a very long time, especially in the eastern United States, that was a primary a visual reference point for mining. You know, folks know about what's going on in Appalachia and the community towns that rose and fell and were linked to coal. And of course, coal does have a deleterious effect on the climate. And so there for better or worse, as a negative association with coal mining in parts of the United States and thus mining in general. And I think what we're starting to see slowly, and it's happening very slowly, is a cultural shift in how we approach mining in this country. And part of that has to be a thought pattern on the average American to think through where we get the building blocks of our everyday lives. Part of that also, more importantly, has to be on the policy side. And they're both linked there uh, because policy, of course, stems from what a populist desires. But right now, on the U.S. federal level, we have a hodgepodge offices of regulatory bodies, of laws on the books that govern extracted projects. And it can be very confusing to figure out your way through that process to get to either a yes or a no. You know, the main law in the United States that has governed hard rock mining on much federal land has been around since 1872 and changed very little since then. That was signed by President Ulysses S. Grant. Now, I wasn't around then, but I guarantee you President Grant never drove in a car or used a cell phone or used a computer. So the law was designed for a different era. And so we have regulations and policies in place that make the permitting regime very confusing for everyone involved in it, whether that's a mining company or even a conservation group that might want to block a project. And so that's the reality as it stands 
right now. There's also the desire around processing. We need to have more processing here. So yes, this is a conversation about putting a quote unquote hole in the ground. But on top of that, we need to then actually be able to process this. And if people don't want a hole in the ground, you know, having a giant essentially chemical plant to process many of these critical minerals into a usable form is is another tough conversation for some communities here as well. But they're important conversations to have. And one of the main thrusts of the book of The War Below is encouraging a broad range of folks to actually think through these areas that this is not a book about geology or investing. It's a book primarily about people and the people that are involved in these tough decisions. Because at the end of the day, we as not only, you know, we in the United States, but also we globally need to be having a discussion about where we get these building blocks. If we don't want to have that discussion, well, that's a choice too. I mean, indecision is a choice. It really behooves us to think through these important areas. You know, one of the points I make in the book, Eric, is that the control of the 20th century economy, of course, was linked inherently to crude oil production. And we didn't really have this discussion around what was implicitly tied up in that 100, 150 years ago when the petroleum-based economy was taking off. And so what did we get out of that? We got climate change, certainly. We got several armed conflicts globally linked to petroleum. Uh, and we got OPEC, you know, a giant cartel that controls a chunk of the world's oil production. And I do argue in the book that unless we're willing to have those tough conversations now, as this 21st century economy ramps up, you know, we could see many of the same mistakes happen in this century because whoever controls the production of copper and nickel and cobalt and lithium and other critical minerals will control the 21st century economy. Ernest, you mentioned the fact that in one hand, we have that need, that urgency in the U.S. There is that understanding in the U.S. that we have to get hold and control of those minerals, critical minerals, copper and cobalt and everything. The U.S. has as those minerals that can even mine those uh, minerals as lithium, for instance. But on the other hand, there's also that complexity that comes with the mining permitting in the U.S., all the laws and very complex laws and laws that people are still hanging on today to block certain mining projects. But when you look at the urgency they have today and the complexity and the un quote unquote, I'd say the unwillingness to change the laws or to move them forward, do you believe that all this complexity comes with the fact that somehow and somewhere in the US, green transition and climate change is not really that an urgent thing within the society and within the political apparatus in the sense like people still want to drive their big SUV, they still want to drive their big cars and big motors, and they don't really feel that urgency of green transition. So that's why overall people say like, mm, we don't really feel the urgency of changing the laws to allow us to be in control of our own green transition future. I'm going to take parts of that and chunks at a time because I think it's such a broad topic. I think in general, the pandemic did help the average American. And just speaking in this answer to the question in the context of, of the United States population, I think the pandemic did focus the mind and encourage people to think through supply chains. And I think everyday Americans do experience more effects of climate change now than perhaps they did 10, 20 years ago. You know, I'm based in Houston, and we just had a hurricane come through at the beginning of July, which is extremely rare to come through at nearly the beginning of hurricane season. Typically, these come much later in the year. So to have a, a hurricane sort of barrel through was not common. And I think that tends to crystallize the mind here. Uh, to your point, though, where we are today, let's just take the U.S. presidential election cycle. The climate change conversation is not as local as perhaps it has been in past cycles. And I think that's due to a confluence of factors that perhaps maybe are more linked to this election, maybe more linked to the state of the U.S. economy right now. But I do think that there is a good chunk of folks in the United States and internationally that care deeply about how we respond to climate, that care deeply about steps that we take to address climate change. Certainly, we know that the United Nations hold a climate change conference every year, COP, that has these topics front of mind and these conversations centered there. The IEA and other international bodies obviously are talking ad nauseum about climate and how we need to think through better ways of bringing our whole planet along in a safe, environmental, and equitable way. And I think what's interesting and holds a lot of promise about the energy transition is that unlike with a petroleum-based economy where you burn off you know, natural gas or crude oil and, and combustion, and then it's gone forever. 
with the energy transition, many of these critical minerals can be recycled and reused and repurposed. You know, lithium doesn't lose its charge just because it's been sitting in a battery for a hundred years. And so that holds a big promise about how we really think through a reuse of products moving forward and can really help us get to a place where we're going to need less extraction and more recycling and repurposing. So it's, I, I do see climate as perhaps playing a backseat in some spheres to other issues, but I don't think it's going away. I think it's going to be an increasingly important topic across our globe. So you've made two interesting points here. One is that climate is not going away as an issue. There's going to be a priority. Clearly, Democrats and Republicans see this issue in radically different ways, but both agree to some extent that at a certain level, critical minerals are important. Maybe Republicans see it in the form of for the defense industry and Democrats see it more in the consumer and cars. You also mentioned- Yes, oh, I just a real quick point on that, Eric. I would just say, I would, I would definitely agree with you. What I would say is I encourage folks to think through the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States and realize the timing in which it was approved two years ago, this month, 2022. It was actually written as a piece of national security legislation, not necessarily a climate-linked piece of legislation. I mean, think about the context. Russia had invaded Ukraine. There was a huge concern, as you shared in the clip from Senator Manchin there, about one country's control over the critical minerals, global supply chain. So many of the mechanisms built into the IRA were designed with national security in mind. And yes, it does tend to be true that Republicans in general look at climate and energy related issues through a national security lens, and Democrats look at these issues through an environmental or an ESG lens. But I think in broad terms, both political parties in the United States do move in the same direction. They just sort of have um, different ideas about how to get there. Very important distinction. But you also pointed out that whoever controls these resources controls key parts of 21st century technology, mobility, security, and all these. The stakes really couldn't be higher. But it's more than just mining and processing, as you pointed out in your book. And let me just kind of bring everybody up to speed on some of the things you talked about in terms of rare earths, which I think are 17 different metals and, and minerals that kind of together form rare earths. Is it 17? Is that the number? Yes. Okay, 17. Now, China discovered that it had an abundance of those rare earths dating back to the 70s. And Deng Xiaoping had this line that we've heard a lot. He said that the Middle East has oil, China has rare earths. And you talk about how just as the Chinese were ramping up their research and development into rare earths, the United States was really starting to cut back. This is decades ago. You quote Mark Smith, who is the CEO of Molycorp, and he testified before Congress in 2010 that his company's 17 scientists were competing with China's 6,000 rare earth scientists, and it wasn't a competition. And so the Chinese have gotten to the place where they are today, not because they just ran out in the past five years to go and invest in mining and processing, but this is a project that is 30 years old at least. Now, if the United States wants to compete, and this is not just the United States, Japan and Europe as well face the same challenge, to try and chip away at China's lead, they're going to have to make this massive investment in R&D, in intellectual development, in think tanks, and put in billions of dollars. It's kind of embarrassing at one level that Biden is talking about putting $35 million dollars into a rare earths company when the Chinese are pumping in billions every year in subsidies. I mean, this just doesn't feel like the U.S. is taking it that seriously in light of the competition that it's up against. Well, I would certainly echo what you were saying, that certainly the competition playing field is vast there. The reality is, is that China, as you said years ago, and as the book dives into it, invested the person power, the capital, and other steps in order to basically corner the knowledge economy for many of these critical minerals. I and mean, what's it going to take to, I think, maybe not fight, but maybe catch up with that might be a better way of looking at it. It's going to take investment in mining education. And so the reality right now is that if you're a young person going into university, perhaps mining engineering is not on the top of your list the way that AI or other tech fields might. Uh, but we need mines in order to have AI, in order to have all these other tech wizardry accoutrements that, that are increasingly part of our everyday lives. 
Um, and so when I talk to, you know, people that are getting out of high school and going into college, I encourage them to think through mining engineering if for no other reason that, you know, the mining companies are extremely, extremely hungry for talent right now. And just building up that knowledge base is going to be so important in the United States and other Western nations in order to be able to run these projects moving forward. We also need a lot of capital investment and research investment from the federal government um, on the mining side. We had a Bureau of Mines in the United States for decades, but it was closed in the 1990s amid a round of budget cuts. And the mine did have a regulatory function somewhat, but it primarily also studied a lot and invested a lot in mining research. You know, things like how do we mine better? How do we develop tailing stands to store mine waste? How do we think through water recycling in mines and other areas that really helped fund many of these cutting edge advancements. By closing a mirror of mines, the United States essentially ceded that knowledge base to China, which is investing heavily and still invests heavily in these areas. In fact, I have this great story in the book about a gentleman that helped China prop up its rare earth industry. He got his PhD at Columbia University in New York. So he was educated in the United States in the 1950s and then went to China to help that country develop its rare earths industry. And so it's going to take, the, I would say, that two-pronged approach, you know, the political will from Washington to invest in mining research and also more interest on the part of our young people to get into and get into mining engineering and related areas there and so we can also build the mine of the future. You know, mines are really complex, interesting places and they're, the challenge is immense, but engineers love challenges. And so I encourage any young person with any passing interest in engineering to think about mining engineering. How likely do you see that to happen in the U.S.? Because when you talk about the U.S. history, how they've moved away from mining activities, how they even closed mining bureau. I'm talking about critical minerals. We were reading a report from Bloomberg, I think it was last year, how they were reporting how the U.S. Army was selling its own stockpile of copper and cobalt because it was not something they really thought about being something important for years. They kind of depleted their stockpile of critical minerals. When you look all that context, don't you see that Today, ask, I mean, the U.S. going back to the mining sector is kind of going back to a place where they see the economy is not there anymore because the way they've been evolving, the way everything was evolving, when you look at the global context, it was like globalization. The developed countries are moving at the first economy. They are more into service now, not primary industry. The primary industry was left to countries like China, Southeast Asian countries or African countries to a certain extent. Now in the mining industry, asking them to go back to the mining industry is like, basically asking the U.S. to go back to a place where they're not used to anymore. We have a whole generation of young people who do not know what mining activities and mining industry is. So when you look and you take all of that in context, do you really see what would be the likelihood for the U.S. to really roll back to the place of, of becoming a country with, and say, first level industry, economy industry with mining and everything? I think there are definitely huge parts of the U.S. government and the U.S. population that do want to move in that direction. You referenced the sale of some stockpiling. The U.S. government does from time to time sell off part of its critical mineral stockpiles for many reasons. In some cases, some minerals can't just be sort of stored on a shelf until you actually need them. And so there is a bit of rotation. But in other areas, you know, there can be other needs in order to do that. But I can tell you the Pentagon especially is very laser focused on ensuring that it has supplies of many critical minerals, including antimony, which is used to make bullets and in the fire retardants. So you can imagine like at a submarine, for instance, you need a lot of antimony and there's no antimony mine in the United States right now, but the Pentagon is supporting one project that's trying to get its permitting. So you've got the Pentagon funding a company that wants to develop an antimony mine at the same time, another part of the US federal government is reviewing that but has yet to actually approve that mine so what you see there is one hand of the u.s federal government maybe not necessarily being in tandem with another part of the u.s federal government and i cite many such examples during the book and got my hands on some emails and some other internal documents sort of exploring this sort of seeming a lack of cohesive strategy from the u.s federal government so yes President Biden, yes, Senator Manchin and others have made very public full-throated endorsements of critical minerals policies, but we don't see a whole of government approach yet to thinking through permitting, to thinking through funding, to thinking through other ways to support. And maybe that will change moving forward, but these are complex areas and, and they don't change overnight. 
Yeah, and the politics are also as complex. So even within Biden's coalition, you've got uh, different parts. You've got one part of Biden's coalition that wants to promote the green transition, but you've got another part on the left that also wants to make sure that endangered species and flowers and wildlife is protected. And and then at the same time, you pointed out that there are about four major constituencies that make this process very difficult. You talk about the role that ranchers play. And ranchers, for those who are not familiar, are popular in sparsely populated Western states who have very powerful senators. You also talked about indigenous populations, environmentalists, and the Bureau of Land Management. That's the agency within the U.S. government that is supposed to regulate all of this. All four of those are very rarely aligned, which is where we have, you know, the stalemate, if you will. And you talked a little bit about also that this results in a, quote, neo-colonial economics of relying on other nations. That was somebody you quoted who said that because we can't seem to get our act together at home to do this. How do you unblock that stalemate? Eric, allow me to add something else based on what you said. Just asking the question like, At the end, don't we see that maybe the U.S. is somehow structurally not ready to compete in that sphere? Because when you take all those complexity, all those agencies that really align in terms of the interest, you see the different stakeholders. When you take the whole U.S. apparatus and all the stakeholders that are involved in designing and drafting and taking action on that, maybe the U.S. is just not, I don't know, structurally equipped to deal with those kind of issues competing with a country like China or other countries. Well, one of the reasons that I wrote the book, in fact, the main reason that I wrote the book was to put these complex issues in front of readers and actually encourage them to really wrestle with how they would come down on the side of this. So when you actually finish reading the book, you don't have a sense of how I as the author feel about these extractive projects. And that was a conscious choice on my part. I wanted the reader to have to actually wade through these complex areas and decide for her or himself, where they would come down on it. So do you favor indigenous and religious rights over extracting copper? Do you feel that biodiversity is less important than fighting climate change? Do you feel that local land rights should uh, be subservient to the green energy transition? None of these are easy answers to uh, you know, decide, but they require us to have a collective wrestling with what we would want to do, especially in the United States, And we're not having that, to Gerard, to your point, we're not really having those discussions, especially in the United States right now. And I wanted the reader to actually have to think through, okay, what would I do if I was in this position? And I think as a thought exercise, having that internal dialogue, then having that debate amongst ourselves in the United States and really globally, then we can speak with better authority to our policymakers, people in state capitals, people in national capitals to say, hey, here's what we want. Because right now what we have is folks that don't fully have a sense of how these critical mineral spheres, these supply chains actually work. And that's going to be really important for us to learn more about, especially as we were discussing earlier, that control of these critical minerals really is going to define the 21st century. So by bringing these complexities to the reader in the book, what I'm actually saying is, yes, right now we're not actively having these debates. We don't have laws that are fit for purpose. So what would it look like if we understood the people and the tough choices that are at hand here, wrestle with them, and then speak perhaps a little more boldly and collectively with what we want to our policymakers? So that's the main thrust here with the book. Well, you said it comes down to choices and consequences. And we spend a lot of time out here in Southeast Asia with our colleague Antonia Timmerman looking at the effects that the nickel mining and processing businesses are having on the environment in Indonesia. And it is violent, painful, disgusting, dirty. And I don't get the sense that people in Japan, the United States, and Europe want to deal with that. And when they see what the true violence to the environment is that's associated with processing. So if it comes down to choice and consequences, can we kind of come to the conclusion a little bit based on the fact that you're trying to spark this conversation that the American public has made its choice. It doesn't really want to do this because why? It's gross and disgusting and painful and violent and, you know, enough constituencies are going to block it and prevent it from happening. Well, I think mining certainly, there's no way around it. It is a intrusive industry. I think there are certainly 
efforts underway to improve mining and there have been huge advancements you know the way that the industry operated 300 years ago is not the way that it operates now just think about safety for instance i mean think about things like air conditioning underground which didn't exist think about um, safety lights you know the concept of having wi-fi underground you know just as a, a basic example there there have been a lot of improvements how the industry thinks through mine design is vastly different now um, and so there have been improvements. Are there still necessary improvements needed to be made? Yes. But I do think that there have been improvements. To your point, Eric, like I didn't want the reader to read through the first chunk of the book and put up her, his hand and say, gosh, this is just such a complex area and just give up. And so I have a chapter in the book about a mining certification scheme, which again, sounds like a sleepy, boring topic, but bear with me here. This was actually started by Tiffany and company, the jeweler. And I had the great opportunity to speak with the former CEO of Tiffany who helped launch this mining certification scheme. IRMA stands for the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. And it was born out of this desire to say, okay, we need critical minerals. So what's the best way to encourage best practices in the mining industry? Of course, Tiffany buys a lot of silver and gold and platinum and other minerals, partnered with some uh, environmental groups and conservation groups uh, and others to form IRMA and the goal of Irma from the very beginning was to say, okay, if we don't have governments across the world working to form better mining standards and mining laws, can we use the power of private industry to encourage better mining practices across the globe? And so the Irma got together mining groups, environmental groups, labor unions, investors, indigenous groups, uh, their customers and others, and put them in a room for a decade and basically said, okay, you guys find and create the best mining standards. And it sounds like they would never actually come to an agreement, but they did. It took, as I said, about a decade, but Irma created what are known as Irma standards, and they go to mines and they audit them against those standards. And then the results are published globally for every, anyone to access. So companies like Microsoft, like Tesla, like BMW and others have said they support Irma and they want to get to a place where they're only buying critical minerals from Irma audited mines. And it'll take a, it'll take a chunk of time to audit mines and to get buy-in, but that is the trend towards the industry. So what does that mean for the average consumer beyond sort of like the wonkiness of it? Uh, that means that right now, as you and I sit here, we can go on to Irma's website and pull up the Irma audit from Albemarle's lithium facilities in northern Chile. And the reason I mention Albemarle is it's the world's largest lithium company. It supplies Tesla, it supplies Volkswagen, and many others. And Chile has the world's largest supplies of lithium. And it's a huge, massive facility there. So you can go on and you can look through how that facility ranks up against Irma standards on water, on labor rights, on indigenous consultation, on safety, on emergency preparedness, and so many other things. And that is designed to give you confidence, A, if you buy one of these products that are built with that lithium from that site, but also B, to encourage best practices at that site. So it's a step forward and the industry, I think, will be the first to admit that it needs to do more, but it's moving in that direction. But using the power of the consumer voice to encourage better practices is a trend that we are seeing in the mining industry. Okay, so looking forward now, what are we supposed to take away from your book? Because we've talked about the difficulties in getting mining permits, but at the same time, the need for this in order to facilitate the green transition. The U.S. has a lot of tools on the table now with the Mineral Security Partnership, the IRA. There's a lot of legislative tools that Joe Manchin talked about. Where does the U.S. go in terms of both competing with the Chinese, but also moving forward domestically and overcoming a lot of the challenges that that you laid out in the book? For me, Eric, it's all about having a conversation. We're not really, as Americans, really as citizens of the world, thinking through where we get the building blocks. And just as a minor contrast, you know, I think in general, the average person might have an understanding of where crude oil comes from. Certainly, folks understand that Saudi Arabia is one of the world's biggest oil producers, or Venezuela has a lot of oil in the ground there. But I don't think there's a realization about where the biggest places in the world for mineral extraction, mineral processing take place. And I think the more that we have that knowledge base, it can inform conversations about where, how, and why we hope to get the building blocks for this energy transition. Closer to home in the United States, I certainly hope that these issues 
become a bigger part of our upcoming elections, not just on the presidential level, but in our different states and locals as well, because I think these issues matter not only for our energy transition, but just for our everyday lives, because supply of these critical minerals matters. And then we also have several projects in the United States that are various stages of development. Some have permits, some are in the permitting process, some are just at the very beginning of the process and looking for financing and other levers of support. Um, and I think the more people think through them and, and study them and are able to speak with more authority to their policymakers, the better we're going to have a broad conversation and understanding about where, how, and why we go here. The Word Below, at its core really though, is a book about community and choice. It's about people because these are issues that affect people. This is not a wonky book for geologists or investors. It's about me and you and everyone else that are really at the center of this story. And so I really hope folks grapple with these areas and think through what they want to tell their elected officials about these important topics. The book is The War Below, Lithium, Copper, and the Global Battle to Power Our Lives. It's an absolute must-read if you're interested in this topic. And we know that regular listeners of this show have been following the critical resources discussion quite closely, so I have a feeling that quite a few people are going to want to check it out. You can buy it at Amazon. You can listen to audiobooks. It's at your library. It's been out for a few months now, so cannot recommend it enough. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to the Amazon store so you can pick it up there. Ernest, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It was very insightful and just uh, really appreciate explaining some of these very complex issues for us. Hey, it was great to be with you both. Thanks for your time and have a great day. Jill, after listening to Ernest and reading his fantastic book, and I cannot recommend this book enough if you're following this topic because you have to understand the U.S. side of this equation in order to understand the dynamics of the competition between the U.S. and China and what's playing out not only in Africa but around the world when it comes to critical resources. But I come back to this gut feeling that I have that the United States just isn't up to this challenge. The quantity of resources that are needed to not only close the gap with China, but also to fulfill the needs of industry are enormous. And the United States, again, talks about this need to compete with the Chinese, and they, they will announce the CHIPS Act, and they will announce all these various initiatives that they're doing, the Mineral Security Partnership and whatnot. But at the end of the day, they are not producing anywhere near enough of these resources in order to fulfill the needs of Ford or GM or Tesla, forcing these companies to have to go out onto the global markets, which invariably puts them in contact with companies like CATL, Zhejiang Huayu Cobalt, and other Chinese companies because they have to out of necessity. And what Ernest lays out so elegantly in his book is the war that he's talking about. Again, I thought it was an international war, an international competition. It's actually a domestic competition among all the various stakeholders who make it nearly impossible for the Americans to mine the resources that they have in their own territory. Yeah, it was really funny when you read the book and you realize it's not really about outside, it's about what's happening in the U.S. And you read the book and you listen to the conversation we just had with him, you realize that, you know, you just wonder, like, how much the U.S. really is determined to win that war if there is that determination. And you more and more you realize there is this dissonance between different compartments of the U.S. administration and U.S. society, not an administration, the U.S. society as a whole on how to approach that. And they really don't have the tools. They're not structurally organized to allow them to fight that fight because the first quote-unquote enemies will be within themselves, will be what we want to do to, to, really be, to really be okay, to say, okay, this is our priority. This is how we're going to move forward. This is what we're going to do. But so far, they created a, an internal system that, that just make them incapable of competing with one structural, centralized country where decision can be done easily, can be taken fast, and can be implemented quickly. And this is where the U.S. is really failing. And I don't see any change happening because we were in Washington DC, we heard many people saying that they like the US democracy. And it's not bad. It's it's really good to love that. They like the way they are. They like the the vibrance of democracy of the, the democracy. But in the same time, the vibrance and the complexity, the check and balances of democracy, the multilateral stakeholders decision making process they've put in place are just putting them in a very 
uncomfortable position to be able to compete with the rest of the world where it's less complex when it comes to taking decision fast and quickly. You know, what's interesting is that when we have these conversations with U.S. stakeholders, not just in government, but also in analysis and scholarship in the think tanks, and invariably we get to this stalemate, this dead end, because what we end up saying is that, well, you don't, the, the Chinese have this centralized system, as you've pointed out, and they're willing to put money behind the private sector as well, oftentimes for strategic reasons, but for market reasons. And, so, and then we'll talk about how they're using subsidies to underwrite the cost of water and electricity and all of these different things that give China what seems to be right now an insurmountable lead in the mining and processing of these critical resources. And then what ends up happening when you kind of confront Americans on this is they get to this point where they say, well, our system just isn't set up to do that. And I will say, well, I'll say, okay, but there's no crying in baseball, right? I mean, like, I understand your system is not set up to that, but at the end of the day, if that's in fact the case, then you can't sit there and complain. And we heard from Senator Manchin, who's saying that Congress is giving the White House the money and the tools to do this. But Biden comes into office on one platform where he's appeasing, say, the environmental coalition of his, the environmental flank of his coalition. And then when he gets into office, wants to make the business side of the coalition happy. But those two are at odds with each other. We are seeing this play out in real time right now with Kamala Harris. And she, remember, four years ago was against fracking, and now she's for fracking. The point is not whether you're for or against. The point is that what it takes to get elected is different than what it takes to govern. And that creates problems in order to compete against the Chinese who don't have these elections that they have to deal with. They don't have civil society groups. They don't have the Sierra Club. They don't have indigenous populations. They don't have all of these different stakeholders who are exerting their rights to be able to frustrate the mining you know, industry. They do have those debates internally, but when they decide, when the decision comes out, no one comes out and says, you know, I'm against that. No, no, no. We, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to move forward. And as you mentioned, as we heard ourselves say, we are not set up to, to do things differently. This is our system. So the question is, why are you engaging in a fight knowing that you are not set up to win that kind of a fight? Why then? Okay, so l let me put the devil's advocate to you, what they will then say to us. And they will say, okay, we are not necessarily going to have to do everything, but we're going to create a network of partner countries who will. So Australia is part of that network, Canada is part of that network, the Europeans are part of that network. So not everything has to be done by the Americans. But the funny thing is that their partner suffered the same structural problem they do face. I think so too. I think so too. The Australians, the French, the Belgium, the British, the Canadian, they all suffered the same structural problem they do face. A lot of multilateral and multilateral stakeholders, civil society, companies, private public companies, and they don't have public companies, private companies and everything. They all suffer the same issues. At the end, all of them, they're finding themselves in a position where they have to rely on private sector's willingness to follow them and everything. And the tools they do have to incentivize their private sectors are so limited to the extent that the private sector will tell them in the eyes that, you know, you want to put that on the table, it's just not enough for us to compete on the market. We're going to have to search for money where we're going to find money. And that money, most of the time, it's always on Chinese hand. Yeah. And yes, so at the end, it's like, to all of them, it's not only about the U.S., to all of them, I will say, why are you guys engaging in a fight that you do know that you are not structurally set to win or to compete for? And here's the last part on this conversation is that just the same way that when Donald Trump says he wants to bring manufacturing back to the United States and manufacturing companies do sometimes come back, they put help wanted signs up on the door. People come in for 24 hours into the job and they say, uh-uh. I'm not yeah, doing I'm this going. job. There's no way. <laughs> it is way too hard. Or why Americans do not pick their own food. Uh, we do not have native-born Americans of you know who come to the fields to kind of bend over every day to pick potatoes out of the ground. 
That is the job that immigrants do. And I think the same reality is going to confront this critical resources debate because I don't think Americans understand just how incredibly violent it is to mine and process these resources. And they will exactly. never conform to the strict environmental regulations that G7 countries have in place. They have built an economy that outsources that pollution to places here in Asia where I live and to places where you live because they don't want their rivers polluted. They don't want to see what happens in Indonesia where it is just, or in the DRC, where the land, I mean, there's no better word to say this, is just getting raped. And so when you hear in Congress this saying, well, we want to mine these resources at home and process these resources at home, I don't think that they are fully thinking through what the consequences of that are. Just the same way that when they say <laughs> they want to bring manufacturing back, the fact is that manufacturing is incredibly difficult to do and brutal work and assembling shoes is not something that Americans want to do. And I don't think Americans really want to mine and destroy their environment for these cars and for these batteries and for these electronics. I just don't think there's a, 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 it's just not in the culture to do. And this is where I join Kobe's point when, when he says that, you know, China is accepted to pay the environmental price to put EV chip, EV batteries on the market, to put cheap solar product on the market. So somehow, yes, they've paid the price to, for the world to benefit of it. So the US, you know, either they take it, either they stop complaining because it's really, the, it's, there's no coherence. You cannot be complaining and wanting a fight and at the same time saying, you know, I'm not set to make that fight. Stop fighting then. Stop fighting. Stop the fight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's, that's probably not going to happen either. So once again, I, I want to recommend Ernest's book if you want to understand the politics of critical resources in the United States. It adds another layer to this discussion and shows just how complex it all is. So, Giraud, let's leave our conversation there. If this is a topic that you find interesting, then Giraud's work is something you definitely want to follow. He has been writing so much amazing work on the China DRC cobalt and copper supply chain. You have a new data set coming out this fall that's yeah, going to update yeah, yeah. from the 22 data to the 23 data. We're going to do a dedicated show on that. We have great briefing reports, also daily coverage and podcasts. The work that Jeho does, though, doesn't happen for free. It needs your support, and that's why we're so grateful to our Patreon supporters, who Jeho, by the way, he is our community manager with our Patreon supporters, so we want to thank everybody there. And if you have a chance to interact with Jeho on Patreon, please, you, you can reach out to him anytime. And also, if you would like to support our work, you can do so by subscribing at chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. We've kept subscription rates intentionally very low in order to make it accessible. And if you are a student or teacher, just send me an email, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I will send you links for half off, just starting at $10 a month. As I learned in the United States, and you were there with me, Giro, this summer, you cannot walk out of a Starbucks for less than 10 bucks. And we think that this subscription is worth more than a visit to Starbucks. So <laughs> let's leave it there. We'll be back again next week with Kobus for another edition of the China Global South podcast. Until then, for Giro Nima in Mauritius, I'm Erica Ulander in Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com.